grace of God because now they're So it's okay to have a minute or two. Can sagen, was last bit is fast. Okay. Aber ah, nein, Obacht, beim ES kommt da eventuell ein Foto hin. Aber dann geben wir das Foto einfach links. Passt. Wenn wir es überhaupt geben, ich bin noch nicht sicher. Okay. Okay, Lichtstimmung, Voice of God. Excellencies, distinguished guests, we invite you to take your seats. Our program will begin momentarily. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, distinguished delegates, honored guests. A very warm welcome to our seventh comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty, Science and Technology Conference, SNT 2023. And what a venue this is. We're so excited to be here at the Hofburg Palace in the beautiful city of Vienna in Austria and to have all of you with us, of course. In fact, I've been told that we are joined by more than a thousand scientists, 
engineers, researchers, academics, member state ambassadors and delegates, international organization and civil society representatives, and journalists too, somebody has to spread the word. And uh, they're all here, all of you are here to take part in this important, and I would also add, timely forum. And at this time, moment in time, I would also like to welcome all the participants who are joining us uh, online. Don't know if I can see you here or there. Uh, and you're using us via our live stream platform, namely Super Event. And uh, I don't know where in the world you're joining us from or what time of day it is. So good morning to you, good evening, good afternoon. It is so very good to have you with us. Today's opening event is also being offered with interpretation into all official CTBTO languages. That is for our on-site guests here. And this is the very first time this is being done for a science and technology conference high-level opening. And this is part of the CTBTO's commitment to reach more people in more languages and in more places for a truly inclusive and a truly global experience. I think it's about time for me to introduce myself just very, very briefly. My name is Monica Jones. I am a freelance conference moderator and news anchor at German international TV broadcaster Deutsche Welle, also known as DWTV, based in Berlin. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here in Vienna with all of you today and truly honored to be the moderator of this morning's high-level opening and in doing so to help kick off what will be, no doubt, an incredible conference of cross-disciplinary engagement, knowledge sharing and innovation. You are going to be very, very busy over the next few days because of the course of this week attendees, namely you, will explore everything from the achievements of a comprehensive nuclear test uh, ban treaty to the, the science and the technology uh, that is used for nuclear test monitoring, uh, all the way to how each and every one of us in our own capacity can contribute to moving us closer to a world free of nuclear tests. That is the aim, that is what we're striving for. This morning, and you can already see the lectern here, we'll be joined by distinguished speakers who will share with us their vision of fulfilling the promise of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which, if I may add, is a need that is just as urgent today, if not perhaps even more so than it was when the treaty opened for signature. That was back in 1996. But it is a goal that is well within reach. We will also hear from a very diverse panel that will explore how the CTBT and in particular the monitoring system that it has built is paying a, an unexpected peace dividend and is benefiting or delivering benefits for humanity in a way that even the treaty's authors could not have imagined. This is going to be very, very interesting. We will have a lunch break because, after all, we're all human and we want you to stay fit and keep your strength. And after that lunch break, the rich discussions continue as we will explore the role of multilingualism as a key facilitator of international diplomacy and the cooperation between the European Union and CTBO as an enabler of nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament efforts. Today's program will conclude with three concurrent panel discussions that will delve into the mutual benefits between Arabic-speaking countries and the CTBTO, regional capacity building in Francophone Africa, and the role of CTBT data in disaster risk mitigation. Those are being held in Arabic, French, and Spanish, respectively. So, as you can see from the lineup, this conference is about having a global conversation, and we encourage all our participants here at the Hofburg Palace in Vienna, but also everyone who is joining us online, to join the discussion on social media using the hashtag SNT2023. 
Now, since the last Science and Technology Conference, in 2021 that was, we have seen renewed momentum for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty's entry into force. Seven countries have ratified the treaty in less than two years, bringing the total number of ratifications to 177 and adding to the nearly universal demand that there be a permanent end to the threat of nuclear testing. Now, that charge for ratifications has been led by our first speaker. Let me just tell you a little bit about him. Dr. Robert Floyd became the fourth executive secretary of the CTBTO on August the 1st in 2021. And since then, he has been at the forefront of the organization's efforts to eradicate nuclear testing as a threat to humanity. Now, for Dr. Floyd, his first day with the CTBTO had additional significance because it coincided with the sixth birthday of one of his grandchildren. And that was an occasion that he says caused him to reflect upon the importance of the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty and why its entry into force is imperative, not just to create a world free of nuclear testing for his own grandchildren, but for all future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it is my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Executive Secretary of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, Dr. Robert Floyd. Foreign Minister, Excellencies, scientific experts from around the world, colleagues and friends from around the world. I just have two special welcomes first to start with. It is a great honor to welcome the Foreign Minister of Somalia, Foreign Minister Harushi. You are welcome here. I so appreciated the opportunity to visit him in Somalia earlier this year. Your participation bears testament to Somalia's strong commitment to the CTBT, and I look forward to strengthening our cooperation. I also want to especially welcome the Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs from South Sudan, the youngest nation in the world. It is particularly important to see the youngest nation committing to the CTBT. You're going to hear more from these two gentlemen shortly, but very special welcome. But to everyone, welcome, both here in the room and those online. As you've heard, it's actually nearly 2,000 people that are either here or online at this conference this year. That is the largest number of people that we've had at a science and technology conference ever. So congratulations to you all for being a part of history. Let me start by talking directly to everyone who's actually here in this splendid hall. As you arrived here this morning, you must have been feeling worried, even nervous, because as you entered this hall, you looked up. You Have a look up now. Isn't it amazing? You looked up and you saw this amazing, massive ceiling. And I'm sure you were thinking very hard indeed about the sheer weight of that ceiling, the colossal tension and pressures it exerts on the wooden beams, on the supporting walls, outward and downward. And you were wondering, won't that beautiful but very heavy ceiling fall down and squash us all? Well, call me an optimist but I'm confident we will survive, at least until the end of my speech. That ceiling and roof, that ceiling and roof of the Hofburg Palace is very strong. It is solid. All being well, the ceiling will look down on fine events like this one for generations, even centuries to come. But why? 
Why is it so solid? The people who built it had no computers. They had no email, no fancy design programs, not even TikTok. They had no calculators, no laser gadgets, no power tools. But what they did have was a way to measure things. They measured exactly what needed to be done to design and build this hall. Then they measured exactly how they were going to do it. And here is my point, friends. They could measure exactly because they had agreed standards of measurement. On Thursday, this week, the date will be the 22nd of June. Let's go back exactly 225 years. I can see the French ambassador here. This one's for you, Excellency. Go back 224 years to the 22nd of June, 1799, in Paris. Not long after the French Revolution. On that day, something happened that changes the world. A metal bar representing a new standard measure, they called it the meter, is deposited in the National Archive in Paris. That bar has been carefully calculated. It's agreed to be one ten millionth of the distance from the equator to the North Pole. They display copies of the bar on walls around Paris. People see what the new meter looks like, and they start using it in most countries. That, sorry, <laughs> that bar can't measure itself. It sets the standard for measuring other things. This new standard catches on around the world. Science needs systematic measurement, right? And systematic standards. Not just for distance, for time, for mass, for temperature, for force, for stress, magnetism, electric current, radiation. But the principle stays the same. There's no measurement without an agreed standard of measurement. You can't be accurate without a standard for accuracy. Nowadays, things have moved on. We don't need a metal bar to define a meter. Instead, we set the standard as the distance that light travels in a vacuum in just under three nanoseconds. That's 10 to the minus 9. That is the distance of a meter. International standards have replaced national and local standards or for ever greater levels of sophistication. Internationally, recognized bodies have been set up under treaties, keeping those many standards in good order. This is why this gathering, here and online, has such symbolic and practical significance. We at the CTBTO have helped bring together about 1,775 scientists, Technicians, ex experts, academics from around the world who use these standards. And mixed with the technical audience, we have at least 150 diplomats. And they represent the states around the world who've agreed the treaties, the conventions that set legal and policy framework. When we last counted, this conference brings together participants from about 147 countries, including the newest country in the world. Just think about all those languages, all those cultures. Yet we have one common language, the language of our internationally agreed scientific standards. Excellencies, colleagues, friends, this is the power of together. This is what the CTBTO, in partnership with all the state signatories, represents. The CTBTO mission stems from a simple obligation spelled out in Article 1 of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, 
which says each state party undertakes not to carry out any nuclear weapon test explosion or any other nuclear explosion. Our job is to detect any signs that that obligation has been broken. We're using sophisticated sensors and sophisticated measurement to detect possible nuclear explosion tests anywhere, any time on Earth. We, collectively, are very, very good at detecting any explosion that might be a nuclear explosion. This makes them so much less likely to happen. Don't try it. You will get caught. Plenty of other national organizations and institutions around the world closely monitor seismic and other activities. They too can distinguish between an earthquake and a possible nuclear test, but the CTBTO is unique. We gather seismic data, measuring vibrations in the Earth's crust. Seismometers measuring velocity in meters per second. They're carefully aligned with geographic north that allows us to determine the precise direction of seismic waves. We gather hydroacoustic data, measuring vibrations in the ocean. We gather infrasound data, measuring vibrations in the air. And we gather radionuclide data, looking for radioactive particles and gases from a nuclear explosion. In all of this, we partner with our state signatories, putting data and analytical capability into their hands. There's nothing else like this on Earth. It's not just that we bring all this data together and then analyze it speedily to formidable levels of accuracy. We're international. Our work is even-handed, is transparent. All the data is available to all our state signatories and can be shared with the world's scientific community. So I say loud and clear to everyone here today, scientists and diplomats alike, you and we together represent global teamwork at its finest. We share a simple political and moral goal, no more nuclear tests. And we share the best available technical ways to make sure we reach that goal. The treaty, the CTBTO set up under the treaty, the full participation of all of our state signatories, and the global network of scientists who support this goal, who invented smarter and smarter new ways to check that we can be sure we're reaching our goal. This is the power of together. Let's look at what our conference this week is contributing. One technology we use is infrasound. An exciting feature of this year's s and is a metrology workshop. Experts will discuss recent successes in robust calibration practices for infrasound technology. By agreeing a new way to link the power of our technology to an agreed standard of measurement, what we're doing, we're opening up the way for all sorts of new developments. This is CTBTO and you, our wider scientific family, helping define the philosophical frontiers of science to get things done in a new and better way. This is big stuff. Let's give ourselves actually a loud round of applause for celebrating this teamwork. So many of you have contributed to it in so many ways. We so appreciate the partnership that is global, that makes our dream and our cause possible. Our planet makes a lot of noise. It's constantly creaking and gurgling and groaning and sighing. And we have to follow all that noise to spot anything in it that might be a nuclear explosion. Our machines and technologies, the machines you here help invent, keep getting better and better, more and more sensitive, 
So does our software for analyzing that data. This conference celebrates how this can work in practice. Our global network of sensors follows the impact of the Hoanga Tonga Hoanga Haape eruption last year. You'll hear more about that on Wednesday afternoon, and they'll try to say it as well. We measured our measurements, we picked up the, that eruption with all three waveforms. The vibrations from that eruption went around the world for several days. You'll hear more about it on Wednesday. Other highlights in this conference, new technologies for our on-site inspections. Sensors and monitors do so much, but from a distance. But when the treaty enters into force, the treaty also provides that scientific experts can visit a site where a suspected test may have taken place to run first-hand checks on and in and above the ground. Their instruments can rule in or rule out evidence of illicit nuclear test activity. There's a powerful exhibit here featuring a helicopter frame down below and screens that show you what might be done from the air in an on-site inspection. Don't enjoy yourself too much inside the helicopter uh, because we want you to come back to the sessions. Here's another example of the power of together. Most major scientific gatherings aren't like this one. They bring together experts in one or maybe two disciplines. Depth, not breadth. But this event is completely different. It brings together so many different disciplines. Seismology, acoustics, meteorology, radiation physics, information technology, software engineering, and representatives of 12 different scientific societies are joining us this week. Again, quite different and hugely important. What an opportunity for thinking outside the box, for seeing so many other boxes to explore, for thinking of ways to combine different boxes or indeed make new boxes. In short, here in Vienna today is a meeting of the global team science. It's taking place to advance one of the great technical issues of our time, one of the great moral issues of our time, ending nuclear explosions. My central theme, the power of together, isn't complete. We need a standard for who counts when we measure together. Let's be honest. Much of the world's scientific leadership has traditionally come from only certain parts of the world. And from one category of people, largely, namely men. This has to change. This is changing. And I see in front of me here some amazing champions for seeing that change on gender in particular. The CTBTO is working really hard to broaden its internal representation and its outreach. You'll see this at this conference with different language panels, presentations from experts from across the world, and keen participation by younger people. You will see it that 50% of our presenters and panelists are women. And please, especially women and participants from less represented nationalities, get inspired and think about applying for jobs and join us at the CTBTO. We would love to welcome you. So, friends, how do I sum up? The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty is a treaty for the world. 186 states have signed the treaty, 177 have ratified it, and there are more ratifications on the way. Sri Lanka completed its domestic ratification process just two weeks ago. And it's my pleasure to tell you that on the 9th of June, the House of the Parliament of Papua New Guinea agreed to ratify the CTBT. 
Can you feel the momentum? And there are even more in the pipeline. This is not done yet. On the ground, under the ground, in the sea, in the air, nuclear explosions will be detected. Since 1996, when the treaty was agreed, before 1996, over 2,000 tests. Since then, less than a dozen test events. No matter where they are, they will be detected. Since, and this century, only one country testing. By any standard of policy and practice, by any measure of success, this is success. Success on a grand scale. Yes, it happened because the world states themselves agreed that enough was enough. But it needed both science and diplomacy. Because the scientists showed that remote verification of nuclear tests was robust and was reliable, the diplomats were able to agree the treaty. We have present with us today some people that were a part of that process of nutting out the final language of our precious treaty. This, friends, is the power of together that you all here today represent. We together use the best possible standards of measuring. And when necessary, we agree new robust standards. And we together measure in incredible detail what's going on. We together analyze in incredible detail what's going on. We together know in incredible detail what is going on. We together are very good at what we do. And as each year passes, we're getting better and better, thanks to you. Don't try to test. You will get caught. I finish with good news and wise words. The good news, the ceiling has not fallen down and our conference will continue, all right? Now the wise words from someone who is both a towering scientist and something of a diplomat, just the right person to guide us today, Leonardo da Vinci. He said, Truth at last cannot be hidden. Nothing is hidden under the sun. And with his wise words, I welcome you to Science and Technology 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Secretary Dr. Floyd. Um, thank you for teaching us a new way to marvel at beautifully ornate ceilings, uh, but even more so for reminding of uh, us all why we're here and certainly what we can achieve together. Well, after this arousing and very inspiring speech, I have to remind you all that we still live in this world and certainly over the last year, uh, this world has been confronted uh, with numerous crises. And we have heard language related uh, to nuclear proliferation that most of us certainly thought was a relic of the Cold War, if only. In fact, in remarks to the 10th NPT review conference last August, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres noted to the, or that the nuclear threat remains very real. And he said, quote, humanity is just one misunderstanding, one miscalculation away from nuclear annihilation. In his roadmap for achieving a more peaceful world, securing our common future, an agenda for disarmament, the Secretary General reaffirmed the importance of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and its entry into force as, I quote again, an essential stepping stone on the path to a world free of nuclear weapons. So you all know you've got your work cut out for yourself. The United Nations High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, Itsumi Nakamitsu, 
is charged with leading the UN's efforts to advance disarmament measures around the world. She couldn't be here with us in person today, but she did send us a video message with her remarks. So let's listen in. Executive Secretary Floyd, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to send this video message to the seventh CTBT Science and Technology Conference. I would also like to convey my regret for not being able to be there in person with you today. In its seventh year, this conference continues to be as relevant as ever. Every passing day, we hear about a new development in the science and technology field that impacts our daily lives and the functionings of our societies. We're in the middle of a technological revolution, one taking place not only in a single area, but in multiple spheres. Artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, quantum technologies, digital technologies, new sensors technologies, and additive manufacturing, to name just a few. These technologies and many others, individually and collectively, have the power to shape the world positively. Rapid advances in science and technology are contributing to human development and serve as key enablers for the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. They have the potential to be used in support of conflict prevention, peace building, and the promotion of inclusive and human-centered approaches. While banking on the benefits of science and technology applications, however, the international community must also be ready to curtail any adverse or unintended consequences of such technologies to international peace and security. For example, while advances in science and technology are no longer solely driven by a few states, the economic and social benefits of technology continue to be geographically concentrated. We need to close the technology gap. The technology diffusion further unveiled gender and social inequalities with different impacts on men, women, girls and boys. The private sector also has a role in evaluating the dual use nature of the products that they develop or systems they design. They can conduct risk assessments around potential misuse and diversion to, military, to the military sector. Furthermore, in recent years, advances in various existing and new weapon technologies have raised ethical, political, legal and humanitarian concerns, including in relation to compliance with international law, especially international humanitarian law and the questions regarding use of force. In the realm of nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, there has been a worrisome trend of um, creating faster, more accurate and stealthier nuclear weapons. New weapons, with the context of rising tensions, raise the dangerous spectra of new tests, undermining the CTBT and the broader disarmament and non-proliferation regime. As noted, technology can be destabilizing. But it is also a force for good, including for the maintenance of international peace and security. I fully agree with Executive Secretary Floyd that the global moratorium against testing derives much of its strength from the continuous development of the CTBTO's verification system. And I agree that the power of innovation in different fields and the synergetic connections between them can contribute to forming a vision for and help to build a world without nuclear weapons. The UN Secretary General has been long committed to supporting efforts that help reap the benefits of advancements in science and technology, while also focusing attention on the international cooperation needed to mitigate possible harm. 
His objective is simple. We must ensure that science and technology applications are used for the benefit of humankind and in accordance with the United Nations Charter and international law, including international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Of course, this is easier said than done. This conference serves as a valuable opportunity for representatives from different fields to engage one another and exchange experiences and practices to improve verification capabilities and promote their role in strengthening the treaty and supporting national needs. Of course, the CTPTO has traditionally been a first adopter in leveraging verification technologies to promote disarmament and arms control. The International Monitoring System, or IMS, has been effective in serving its core purpose of detection. The vast data generated by the IMS also contributes to other areas that can benefit humanity, including tsunami warnings, radiological emergency response, and natural disaster risk reduction through the innovation and integration of systems. Through its sharing of open data, the CTBTO has been able to make significant contributions in various fields, from increasing state accountability in their nuclear activities to supporting states in achieving their sustainable development goals through technology transfer and capacity building training. This has raised the importance of the openness of data and brought new approaches to verification and confidence building key factors in nuclear disarmament and risk reduction that the world urgently needs. The full potential of the CTBTO will only be realized through the CTBT's entry into force. In this respect, I express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Floyd and his team for their enormous efforts in pursuing the signature and ratification of those remaining non-Annex II states and the eight Annex II states whose ratification is essential for the treaty's entry into force. Thanks to such tireless endeavours, five countries have newly ratified the treaty since June 2022, moving the treaty closer to universalisation. The CTBT has been instrumental in upholding the norm against explosive nuclear testing and it is now difficult to imagine a world without the treaty's normative pillar. The continued reinforcement of this norm will rely on our ability to exploit advances in science and technology to make greater contributions to nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. I look forward to the fruits of your discussions and to leveraging collective expertise and knowledge of the scientific technical, academic and policy-making communities. I thank you very much for your attention. And we thank the United Nations High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, Itsumi Nakamitsu, and her staff at the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs for their long-standing advocacy and support of the CTBT and the work of the CTBTO. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker, this is going to be short because he's no stranger to those of you who have watched the news of the past year unfold. The International Atomic Energy Agency works for safe, secure, and peaceful uses of nuclear science and technology and is a key pillar of the nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament architecture. Rafael Grossi has been a staunch partner to and supporter of the CTBT and CTBTO, both during his time as ambassador of Argentina to the United States in Vienna, and also in his current role as Director General of the IAEA. Director General Grossi, welcome to the SNT 2023 stage. It's good to have you here. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here 
with my good friend, Executive Secretary uh, Robert Floyd, who, with whom I have been working for many, many years on uh, issues uh, that are so important and go to the heart of international peace and security. Uh, it is, of course, not a surprise that uh, not myself, the IAEA, uh, should be here uh, joining this important s and conference, which has become uh, one of the most expected um, and more important events uh, in the city of diplomacy in, in Vienna because of the importance of the message, because of the importance of the issues that are discussed uh, here. The IAEA and the CTBTO share more than the vicinity in the halls of the Vienna International Center. We are together, the power of together. We are together part of an architecture a family of efforts, indeed, that we put together as an international community to try to prevent the proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons. Um, the moderator was reminding that I used to be an ambassador to the CTBT, but I was before that a negotiator of the CTBT in the halls of the Conference on Disarmament at the Palais de Nations uh, in um, Geneva. Uh, so, I am acutely uh, aware of the uh, essential importance of this instrument without which the non-proliferation system that we have is simply incomplete. So, we need, as my friends at the CTBTO say, we need to finish what we started. And this must happen. And I think in this summer of 2023, which is not an easy one. I am just back from a combat zone where the IEA is trying to prevent a nuclear accident at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. So we know, we know that all the efforts and the importance of the role international organizations like the CTPTO and the IEA can play in this regard. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is reassuring for all of us to hear from uh, Executive Secretary Floyd and from his team of experts, the world's most brilliant seismologists, radionuclear experts, um, hydroacoustic uh, experts that we have, that they have everything in place to make sure that no nuclear test will go undetected. Above and beyond this, science and technology at the service of non-proliferation must be strengthened. And this is the basic message. And this is the message that we from the IAEA are bringing here to our friends, to our colleagues of the CTBTO. As they would say, above the noise, there is the truth. And they are there to prove it. Thank you very much, and I wish you all an excellent conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, DG Grassi, for this very important statement here, your message and your continued support of the treaty. Thank you. Nuclear weapons free zones are important elements in strengthening global nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament norms as they prohibit the spread of nuclear weapons in certain regions. And these treaties are complementing to the CTBT. The Treaty of Pelindaba established such a zone on the African continent when it entered into force in 2009. Coincidentally, both the Treaty of Pelindaba and the CTBT opened for signature in 1996 and have since developed mutually reinforcing synergies. Somalia has demonstrated its commitment to nuclear non-proliferation as a signatory to the Pelindaba Treaty, as well as the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. Dr. Floyd uh, had the opportunity to travel to Somalia earlier this year. By the way, the first CTBTO Executive Secretary to do so. And during his mission, our next guest reiterated his country's commitment to the nuclear disarmament deal. 
and we're very happy to have him here. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency Abshir Omar Jamar Huruse, Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Somalia. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Mr. Executive uh, Secretary, Your Excellence, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a great pleasure and an immense honor to address you today at the Science and Technology Conference, SNT 23 representing Somalia in this esteemed gathering as we convene for this momentous occasion. I am reminded of the resilience and determination that brought us here after the global pandemic cast in shadow upon us. I am filled with admiration for the convergence of over a thousand brilliant minds scientists, researchers, technology experts, academics, diplomats, government officials, civil society members, and aspiring youth. This collective pursuit of knowledge and progress in the field of comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty is truly inspiring. Today, we gather not only to celebrate interact but also to embrace the harmony of science and technology, united for the noble cause of global peace and security. Throughout this conference, as we delve into the complexity of CTPTs, science and technology, and explore its robust verification system, let us take a moment to reflect upon the profound impact of this treaty on our world. The CTBT stands as a cornerstone and an indispensable component of the global non-proliferation and disarmament architecture, safeguarding our collective well-being. Its uniqueness lies not only in its objectives, but also in its cutting edge verification system with a state-of-the-art global network of 304 certified monitoring stations, no nuclear explosion goes undetected, providing essential reassurance to the nations of the world. The value and significance of the CTPT resonate across continents and cultures as demonstrated by its remarkable membership of 186 states, including 51 African nations. In Somalia, we uphold a principled stance in support of international peace, and our unwavering commitment to a world free of nuclear weapons remains steadfast. We stand tall guided by these noble principles and work tirelessly towards a more peaceful and harmonious world. Let it be known that our resolute statements and positions in international fora, as well as the treaties we are bound by, including the 1996 Partial Test Ban Treaty, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, NPT and the African Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaty, the Treaty of Belendaba, demonstrate Somalia's unwavering dedication to international peace and security and unwavering commitment to the core principles of CTBT, despite the unique national circumstances that have tested our resilience. We have triumphed our adversity and now stand poised to fulfill our duties. It will be remiss if I did not express my deepest gratitude to Dr. Robert Flood and his dedicated team. Their tireless advocacy and unwavering efforts have brought the CTBT closer to Somalia. 
I extend my heartfelt appreciation to the Executive Secretary for his official visit to Mogadishu last February and for extending the gracious invitation to my delegation to partake in this significant, significant conference. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, today I stand before you to reaffirm, to reaffirm Somalia's unwavering commitment to playing a constructive role in carving the proliferation of nuclear weapons. We unequivocally condemn any testing of nuclear weapons, recognizing their devastating potential and the dire con consequences they entail. As Somalia embarked on a momentous journey of liberation from terrorist elements, uh, stabilization, reconciliation, socio-economic development, we remain cognizant of our international responsibilities. We understand that signing and ratifying the CTPT is not merely a symbolic gesture, but a testament to our unwavering dedication to global peace and security. Rest assured, we shall fulfill the needful. To simplify that, Somalia is going to sign the treaty and our relevant institutions are enthusiastically waiting, endorsing, in order to pave the way the ratification of the treaty. Thank you. And as we undertake our internal processes, the principles and processes of the CTPT that shall get our effort in the days and months to come. In our pursuit of progress, Somalia recognizes the indispensable role of science and technology. We are deeply enthusiastic about establishing a CTPT national data center in Somalia at the earliest opportunity. We wholeheartedly embrace the potential that CTPT data and technologies hold for various civil and scientific applications, facilitating our national development and offers. We eagerly anticipate the provision of essential equipment and training to harness the trans transformative power of science. Excellence, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, today I stand only as a representative I stand not only as a representative of Somalia, but also as a voice for Africa and the world. Our continent, Africa, has endured the tragic consequence, consequences of nuclear test explosions in the past. It's our shared responsibility to declare in unison, never again. We stand united, determined to ensure that the harmful effects of nuclear tests are forever banished from Africa's shores and beyond. Let us remember that our collective shield against nuclear threats lies in bolstering the global nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime. I commend the CTPT's role in safeguarding our planet for the current and future generations. We bear a collective responsibility here and now. Therefore, I call upon nuclear weapons states to maintain the moratorium of nuclear testing, expedite the entry into force of the CTPT, and, ad and ardently strive towards complete an irreversible disarmament. In conclusion, I extend my deepest appreciation to all of those who have contributed to the success of this conference. Let us harness the power of science and technology, fortified by our unwavering commitment to forge a world 
free from the specter of nuclear weapons. Together, we shall build a future characterized by peace, security, and prosperity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Your Excellency, certainly for your very express commitment to advancing global movement against nuclear testing. Thank you so much, much appreciated. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in less than two years, you heard it earlier, the CTBT has seen seven additional ratifications, three of them African nations, bringing the total of state signatories on the continent to 51. What's more, in Southern Africa, the treaty is universally adhered to, as is the case in both the Central Africa and Western Africa sub-regions, respectively. In February this year, Dr. Floyd had the honor to visit Juba, where he met high-level officials who reiterated support for the objectives of the CTBT. Distinguished guests, please welcome to SNT 2023 a representative of Africa's newest sovereign and independent state. His Excellency Mayandut Wall, South Sudan's Under Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, moderator. Dear Executive Director, Secretary Dr. Robert Floyd, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, esteemed scientists, ladies and gentlemen, I will pass my greeting from Africa, from Cape Town in far south to Alexandria in far north, and from Mogadishu in the Indian Ocean to, to Dakar in in Atlantic Oceans. It is my honor for me today to address this year comprehensive nuclear test-based treaty organization, science and technology conference. Today, our presence here is a testimonial of our commitments towards promoting science and technology in favor of global peace and security. I'm convinced that promoting science and technology can help us achieve sustainable development goals and able us in a global source, particularly in Africa, to promote our economics and well-being of our people. I am honored to deliver this statement on behalf of my acting minister, Honorable Deng Dao, who was supposed to be here but is busy somewhere. First and foremost, I wish to note my persuasion for Executive Secretary Dr. Robert for his friendships and kind invitation to these important events. Dr. Floyd visit to Juba, South Sudan on 15 February this year, marks the first visit of CTBTO to our country, and we were very grateful to have him. We persuade the importance of a comprehensive nuclear test-based treaty, and we support its objectives and goals. The government of South Sudan, just like many other African countries, governments recognize the critical role of science and technology as university and abolus for addressing peace and security, poverty, eradication, inequalities, health, environmental observations, climate change impact, digitizations, and scientific and sustainable development goals. For the matter, the African Union, AU, adopted the science, technology, and innovations of Africa strategy 2014-2024. It was important to highlight that the conference STEAM, CTPC, science and technology, benefited us all. It is in line with Africa Union science, technology, and innovations for Africa Strategy 2024, which was launched in 2014. His Excellency, the President of the Republic of South Sudan, Selva Kirmayadid, and the government, the entire government of South Sudan, together with 
intergovernmental authority, IGAT, member states, remain, remain key on a peace and security in our regions and, and Africa. South Sudan is committed to international peace in all its forms, and we acknowledge the value of CTPT and related treaties for global peace. In addition, South Sudan is ready to work alongside the international community together. We can build a future where the devastating impact of nuclear tests is forever eradicated. Furthermore, we are resolved to our commitment to foster relation, uh, partnerships and collaborations that facilitate the excellence of experts, training, and resources in this regard. We would be interested in pertaining technology cooperation support to strengthen capacity building of our nas national experts, including in areas of CTPTO, comparative and advantage, by empowering our scientists, researchers, technicians, we can actively contribute to global efforts in the nuclear disarmament and the peaceful uses of a nuclear energy. In conclusion, South Sudan is keen to sign and ratify the CTP treaties as a commitment to international peace and security in the nearest time. The recent access of South Sudan to the Biological Weapons Conventions in February 15 this year is manifestations of the South Sudan government commitment in promoting peace and security at the globe, global level and support the related treaties for the world peace. Thank you for your attention, and I urge all to keep sharing knowledge going forward because there is still much we can learn from each other. I wish you a productive conference and let's keep move together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for your express commitment to international peace in, in all its forms and uh, the recognition, of course, uh, of the valuable role that the CTBT plays in that context. Now, the urgency of the CTBT's entry into force is as pressing now as it was in 1996. That is uh, some 27 years ago now. Um, the reality of this urgency is not lost on the younger generation, on youth leaders. They are playing an ever more important role in the fight to see a permanent and universal ban on nuclear testing. After all, it's them and their children who inherit the world. From scientific inquiry and research to technological innovation and advocacy, they are stepping up today to create a safer and more secure tomorrow. And we are delighted to have a youth leader here with us at SNT 2023. So please join me in welcoming scientist and researcher and past participant in the CTBTO Mentorship Program for Young Women in STEM, Aline Olvera. Thank you, very, thank you very much. It's a honor to be here. So this is going to be in Spanish. So please take your devices close to you. Buenos dias. Good morning. Good morning to all the attendees gathered at this Imperial Palace of Hofburg and virtually. My name is Aline Oliveira, and it's a privilege to welcome you here all today. Dear colleagues, researchers, professors, and brilliant minds of today and tomorrow. It is an honor to have your presence on this special occasion. Today marks a significant milestone in our collective journey. By coming here together, we embark on a shared mission to approach global security. This occasion is also a celebration of collaboration. The diversity and breadth of perspectives represented here are truly impressive. And they are the product of all our efforts. However, while there has been significant progress in the inclusion and engagement of stakeholders, it is imperative to recognize that we need to look beyond. 
As a participant in the CTBTO Women in STEM mentorship program, and as a representative of youth, as a woman, and as a scientist, it is with a deep sense of responsibility that I address you to discuss and promote youth empowerment within the scientific community and on the international stage. Together, we can strive towards the realization of a world free from nuclear tests. The importance of Nurturing and empowering young minds in the field of science cannot be overstated. The future of scientific progress and global peace lies in the hands of the next generation. By providing mentorship, guidance and opportunities, we can inspire and equip our youth with the tools they need to make significant contributions to the scientific community. The empowerment of youth is the fundamental pillar upon which the future is built, and it requires concrete actions. Let's reflect upon the clear example of the regional introductory course for on-site inspections that was held in April this year. There were 80 participants. 39 were representatives of youth, young people building experiences together with CTPTO specialists. These are precisely the crucial approaches that we refer to when we talk about participatory and equal spaces. Let us continue on this inclusive path and keep learning from the generations of Women in STEM mentorship program, from the youth group and from the young people out there who believe in our work. Let us make their needs our own and find solutions together. Trust is a two-way street and let's take a resounding step. To the young people listening to me, have confidence in your ability to influence decisions and create a positive impact in your countries and on the international stage. Let your participation make a difference. I urge you to stay informed about the progress and challenges in implementing the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Learn as much as you can from reliable sources Participate in spaces like this year's Science and Technology Conference, the Science Diplomacy Symposium, engage with regional courses and youth groups, and collaborate with specialists. Make this conference a personal opportunity. And when you return to your communities, share your experiences and guide paradigm shifts. Today, I encourage you to assume responsibility and to lead the way towards the prohibition of nuclear testing. Our participation is non-negotiable. Dear colleagues, this is a call for action. Let us make our mission a long-term effort that generates results for and from all generations. And once again, I extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you. Let us seize this opportunity to connect, collaborate, and make a pivotal impact. Thank you for your presence and let us make the most of this momentous occasion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Olvera, for bringing your energy, your expertise, your youth, innovation, and passion here to the s and 2023, and certainly uh, for ensuring also, again, how important the work is of securing a nuclear test-free future. The International Monitoring System, in short, IMS, is a marvel of engineering and a testament to what can be achieved when scientific collaboration, together, and political cooperation, together, combine for the greater good. Now, the United States is a strong contributor to the verification regime, hosting some 40 IMS stations and contributing to the technical expertise the IMS depends on to ensure its continued readiness and ability to detect a nuclear test by anyone, anywhere, at any time. And this brings us to our next high-level speaker here at SNT 2023. Jill Ruby is the Undersecretary for Nuclear Security of the U.S. Department of Energy and Administrator of the National, or National Nuclear Security Administration. 
And that has a host of responsibilities, including supporting the development, negotiation and implementation of arms control treaties, clearly a critical factor in ensuring such agreements are successful. Dr. Ruby, the stage is all yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure and honor to be here today as the United States Undersecretary for Nuclear Security for the Department of Energy and the Administrator of the National Nuclear Security Administration. The National Nuclear Security Administration's responsibilities include the design, production, and maintenance of the nuclear arsenal for the United States and the advancement of nonproliferation and arms control. I'm here today to express the strong and enduring commitment by the United States to the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. I hope to illustrate our commitment by outlining the nuclear principles and obligations of the United States and discussing how the National Nuclear Security Administration uses science-based stockpile stewardship to meet our obligations, including the con conducting subcritical nuclear experiments. To conclude my remarks, I will put forward some ideas on advancing transparency. The United States has a simple overarching principle about nuclear, our nuclear arsenal. As long as nuclear weapons exist, the United States will maintain a safe, secure, and effective nuclear stockpile for our security and that of our allies and partners. We have formalized processes and as for assessment and policy reviews. Relevant to, the, to today's meeting, the Biden administration's 2022 Nuclear Posture Review states, quote, consistent with the goals of the CTBT, the United States continues to observe a moratorium on nuclear explosives testing and calls on all states possessing nuclear weapons to declare and maintain such a moratorium, end quote. With the current international environment that includes countries making advancements in their nuclear arsenals and some threatening to use and, te and test nuclear weapons, the CTBT and the associated monitoring and verification regime are more important than ever. The United States applauds Dr. Floyd's tireless and successful efforts to get seven additional countries to ratify the CTBT and I understand others are in progress. Nonetheless, there remains both political and technical concerns that pose barriers to the U.S. ratification of the CTBT. Additionally, in our government that relies on checks and balances, the National Nuclear Security Administration is required to retain a test readiness posture. There is a natural tension in the policy to observe the test moratorium, support the CTBTO prep comm functions, and retain test readiness. As I hope you will see, we manage this tension with integrity. Importantly, the United States has not conducted a nuclear explosive test since 1992, and the National Nuclear Security Administration has not been directed to prepare for a new test. In fact, for 30 years, the National Nuclear Security Administration has been allocated substantial and sustained funding to advance its science-based stockpile stewardship program that, along with regular flight and lab tests, serves as the basis to maintain the safety, security, reliability, and effectiveness of the U.S. stockpile without nuclear explosives testing. The Science-Based Stockpile Stewardship Program was created because legislation was passed when President Clinton signed the CTBT in 1996. That legislation required an annual letter to the President reporting on the safety, reliability, performance, and military effectiveness of the stockpile, as well as whether nuclear explosive testing is necessary to resolve any issues identified. 
Scientists and engineers in the NNSA nuclear security enterprise work daily to support the annual assessment. And once a year, the results acquired by each of the three national security laboratories are presented to the laboratory director, who in turn writes a letter to the Secretary of Energy. A similar process is conducted by the commander of U.S. Strategic Command producing a letter to the Secretary of Defense. The Secretaries of Energy and Defense then write a letter to the President that reports on the stockpile and whether there is a technical or military need to test. The other four detailed letters are attached without edits. When I was the director of Sandia National Laboratories, I wrote annual assessment letters, and I can say it is a rigorous process and a sobering responsibility. The technical evidence includes detailed simulations on high-performance computing platforms. The physical understanding to develop and validate the simulations is obtained from data collected and highly diagnosed experiments at above-ground science facilities, such as the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and the Dual Axis Radiography Hydrodynamic Test Facility, DART, at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Other experiments are conducted underground at the former Nevada test site, now called the Nevada National Security Site, or NNSS. Some of these experiments contain nuclear materials, but none create a supercritical nuclear chain reaction. These experiments are all consistent with the CTBT limitations. Furthermore, all key nuclear components for current and planned systems in the U.S. stockpile are based on previously tested designs. Additionally, the United States has significantly reduced the quantity and types of nuclear weapons in our arsenal since the last nuclear test in 1992. For all these reasons, we have been able to maintain the safety and performance of our stockpile without further nuclear explosive testing. I would like to now go into a bit more detail on our experiments at the Nevada National Security Site. Currently, the NNSA is building two new subcritical experimental test beds at the U1A complex in Nevada. The test beds will provide data to help address stockpile questions without, with a special focus on the impact of plutonium aging on weapon performance. Since halting underground nuclear explosive tests, the United States has executed 33 subcritical experiments. The United States is preparing to execute two subcritical experiments in 2024 and plans to conduct approximately three subcritical experiments per year by the end of the decade. The Nevada National Security Site is also being used for nonproliferation research. For example, when experiments are conducted within the UNA complex or the Big Explosives Experimental Facility, a high explosives research facility also located at the Nevada National Security Site, monitoring is done to improve our understanding of subcritical experiment signatures. Nonproliferation research to improve low yield nuclear monitoring is also conducted at NNSS using chemical high explosives. Using the UNA underground complex to conduct subcritical experiments and using other capabilities at NNNS, NNSS <clears throat> for the science based stockpile stewardship program and nonproliferation is the method used by the United States to maintain test readiness. This approach provides experience to people to work underground and maintains the infrastructure and expertise in diagnostics at NNSS. Their work advances our scientific goals in both our weapon and nonproliferation programs. Through these activities, we can continue to be a responsible nuclear weapon state. Beyond our commitment to conduct only subcritical experiments, the United States is also committed to transparency. 
We have maintained a commitment to transparency in our stop bio stewardship program and our subcritical experimental programs for decades. We were pleased to host Dr. Floyd and his colleagues at our, at our NNSA headquarters in Washington, D.C. in September 2021, at Pacific Northwest Laboratory in October 2022, and at Los Alamos National Laboratory, Sandia National Laboratory, and the Nevada Nuclear Security Site this April. We are also exploring ideas to provide further transparency into our program. These ideas are meant for bilateral or multilateral cooperation, and we are eager to work with those who share our goal of greater transparency. We are open to hosting international observers for monitoring and verification research and development on our subcritical experiments. We have hosted international observers for past underground chemical high explosives tests and intend to extend invitations for future experiments. Event notifications of our chemical high explosives tests are sent to regional seismic networks as well as the CTBTO PREPCOM through the U.S. mission in Vienna. Public sharing of, our, of the data gathered from high explosives events occurs and we will continue to publish and present geophysical experimental findings in peer-reviewed journals and conference proceedings, including source terms and collection information. We are also open to working with others to develop a regime that will allow reciprocal observation with radiation detection equipment at each other's subcritical experiments to allow confirmation that the experiment was consistent with the CTBT. We have several well-considered technical ideas on how this could be effective. Additionally, I look forward to your ideas on further transparency. NNSA is exploring the possibility of live streaming or otherwise releasing video of our subcritical experiments. Our intent is the long, in the long term is to create an environment at the Nevada National Security Site that allows for the possibility of observers to attend from a control room or other vantage point to support chain of custody for detection equipment and to witness subcritical experiments consistent with the CTBT. I sincerely look forward to, a, to future engagement with Russia and China on participation in bi or trilateral verification confidence building, and other technological interactions to support future arms control and nonproliferation agreements. If you would like to know more, I encourage you to attend NNSA's Deputy Administrator for Defense Nuclear Nonproliferation, Corey Henderstein, as she speaks about examples of U.S. transparency and verification supporting nuclear nonproliferation tomorrow at 3 p.m. To conclude, I want to emphasize again that the United States fully observes the CTBT and is committed to work to achieve its entry into force, recognizing the significant challenges that lie ahead in reaching that goal. We have not conducted a nuclear explosive test since 1992 and have no plans to do so. The United States is also committed to annual stockpile assessments, science-based stewardship, and test readiness. We will achieve our objectives in part by conducting subcritical experiments at the former test site, complemented by focused experiments and detailed simulations executed els elsewhere in the U.S. nuclear security enterprise. And today, we put forward ideas on how to advance transparency with the hope we can work with others that support the CTBT. Thank you for your attention and for your contributions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ruby, for the United States' long-standing continued support of the international monetary system. Well, let's take a breather. And let's remind ourselves of where we are. We are in a conference hall at the Hofburg Palace in Vienna. Beautiful Vienna, the capital of Austria. And some would also say the capital of music. It's inspired so many, so many great composers, Mozart, Mahler, Beethoven, Johann Strauss. 
And the qualities that make the city an inspiring hub of artistic expression also make it a center of diplomacy, with the city hosting more than 40 international organizations, including one of the four headquarters of the United Nations. So it is only fitting that a science and technology conference held here at the Hofburg Palace in Vienna brings together the innovation and technology of the new with a classicism for which this city is probably best known. And I now have the pleasure of inviting to the stage Sabina Hasanova on piano, Jenny Lippel on violin, and Miha Ferk on saxophone. Together, their trio Clavis, and they will perform for us Mozart's Kegelstadt Trio. Enjoy. Thank you. 
Trio Clavis, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you so much for touching our souls with your music. Thank you so much. I don't know about you, but when I listen to Mozart, you can't help but feeling the world must be good. Or at least there must be some good in this world. Now, you see, we already have uh, the scene set for our next session, which is going to be a panel discussion. Now, when the Conference of Disarmament began negotiations on the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in Geneva in 1994, the world had witnessed a period of unrestrained nuclear testing between the dawn of the atomic age in 1945 until 1996, when the CTBT opened for signature more than 2,000 nuclear tests were conducted in locations around the world. Now, the negotiators of this treaty obviously sought to put the brakes on an arms race that threatened not only global peace, but threatened humanity as a whole. The key to the treaty's stated aim is an international monitoring system that ensures no nuclear tests can be conducted in secret. But the verification regime has delivered so much more and we will hear about that now. In our next segment, we will hear from five distinguished guests about how the science and technology behind the CTBT's monitoring system are delivering benefits for humanity in a quite diverse way. I look forward to the discussion, and I'm absolutely pleased and delighted to invite to the stage now as we get the final uh, glasses of water and everything served. 
I would like to invite to the stage now, with your support, His Excellency Mr. Li Song, Permanent Representative of the People's Republic of China to the United Nations and other international organizations in Vienna. Good to have you here. Please take a seat. I would also like to invite Dr. Choli Perez Campos, Director of the International Monitoring System Division of the CTBTO. I would like to welcome Dr. Dvikorita Karnavati. She is head of the Indonesian Agency for Meteorology, Climatology, and Geophysics, and chair of the Intergovernmental Coordination Group of Indian Ocean Tsunami Warning and Mitigation System. She's also permanent representative of Indonesia with World Meteorological Organization and steering committee of Global Ocean Observing System. Good to have you with us. And we have one more lady talking about not enough female scientists here, Dr. Floyd. I think this panel proves you wrong. Dr. Antonietta Rizzo, head of laboratory for methods and techniques for nuclear safety, monitoring and traceability at the Italian National Agency for New Technologies, Energy and Sustainable Economic Development. And last but not least, we have one more chair for Mr. Jeff Bromfield. He's senior editor and science correspondent for the National Public Radio Science Desk. And now, thank you so much for being here. And please do take a seat, make yourself comfortable. So I've, I've mentioned already so much, also right at the beginning, uh, when I welcomed everybody here, that uh, the international monitoring system is, is really quite a marvel and uh, surprises us, us all with the different uh, science that it can assist and uh, create and, and help the world to be a better place as such. Uh, before I go into details with each and every one of you, just very, very briefly, I would like to know, because we've heard so much about the CBT uh, today, the CTBT, um, if you could say it in, in one, maximum two lines, how would you describe the CTBT? Is it like the salvation of the world, nice to have? I mean, how would you, what is the CTBT to you, Ambassador Lee? To me, it's a very special moment because uh, I personally uh, participated in the uh, CTBT negotiations and I witnessed the start of this negotiation and the uh, conclusion of this treaty. So uh, as for your question, what CTBT means to me, I would say CTBT means uh, the start of my career. And also, it's a basis for multilateral efforts ever since the end of the Cold War that the N5, together with the international community, to come up with this, uh, this, uh, this wonderful treaty, mm. which sets, sets the norm for, uh, for a global ban for nuclear testing. And I believe the norm will uh, continue to uh, stay with us in the years to come. Thank you. I like that line, the CTBT means the start of my career. That's, that's a great headline. If you ever write a book, I think it should have that title. Uh, Dr. Perez Campo, what's it mean to you? Uh, I first heard about it when I was an undergrad in Mexico. And for me, it represented a future, safe future, um, and something that gave me hope. So I'm so honored to be part of the CTVTO now. Thank you so much. Dr. Kanavati, before we get into all the early tsunami warning, all that, uh, the CTBT, to you personally, what does it mean? Well, actually, CTBT, oh, or CTBT, is a strategic and the life safer for now and future generations. That's why I'm really honored to be invited here, together here, for sharing and learning the science and technology together. Thank you very much for the invitation to the Secretary General. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Dr. Rizzo. Yes, for me, CTBTO marked really the, the return, the comeback to the work after permanency. So it was very, very important for me to, to start to work again uh, after this uh, interruption. 
And uh, as a scientist, uh, it was uh, the place in which I, I learned uh, what is the meaning of uh, a, a co collaborative competition that is very important for a scientist. And as a, a mother, uh, it was uh, also uh, very important to, to work to, to let to, to our generation a, a better world. Collaborative competition. Yes. I like that. I like that. Uh, Jeff Bloomfield, what's it mean to you? Well, the CTBT is maybe my favorite nuclear test ban treaty yet to enter into force. Um, love the fissile material cutoff treaty too, though, so no disrespect to that. Um, I think this is also, for me, this is maybe in my 20 years of covering nuclear uh, sort of weapons and nuclear physics, this is, it's never felt more relevant, which is slightly worrying. I think that, that we are entering an era where the CTBT feels, and the CTBTO in particular, feels more important than it really ever has. And maybe we can talk a little more about that. But. We can be really grateful that it exists already, can't we? Well then, let's get into the field of uh, your expertise and the start of your career. Obviously, I would like to start with you, Ambassador Lee, because you mentioned it already, you were a delegate uh, in Geneva when the CTVT was negotiated. I was uh, in the conference of disarmament. So, as somebody who was there at the very start, as the document took shape, um, could you tell us what it was like to get this treaty negotiated? Uh, because it was not something that happened overnight. Uh, and also maybe about the timing that it happened. Um, and because we do talk about the IMS in particular in this panel also, um, how was that envisaged back then? Thank you, thank you. Thank you for mentioning about the timing for this uh, negotiation. I think it is indeed very important. It is, uh, we have this uh, negotiation started and, and the treaty concluded. Uh, uh, just a couple of years after the Cold War. And uh, I believe that's uh, that we, we called uh, the uh, uh, golden ages for multilateral arms control and disarmament effort. And uh, during the CTBT negotiations, I would say, you know, the time is very important. Cold War is away. And there isn't any Cold War mentality or block confrontation or even politicalization in the meeting room. And uh, people are concentrating our effort on treaty provisions, political provisions, and also provisions on verifications, including the uh, system of IMS, so that uh, we put all our different ideas, different concerns together and work on them. And eventually, we address each and every national concern and come up with uh, all those necessary provisions for this treaty. Uh, so we have this treaty. I think this is very important. Just now, uh, uh, Executive Secretary, Secretary uh, Floyd mentioned the power of together. I would add to his statement that uh, it is the power of looking ahead to, in the same direction for all the countries involved in that treaty negotiation. I think it is indeed very important. Both the P5 or N5 are looking at the same direction together with other members of the international community to look uh, in the same direction to have this treaty. Mm. I, I, I said that this is the start of my career and I benefit a lot from this conviction that we can, when we look at the same direction, we can achieve, achieve treaty like CTBT and many other efforts. I'm still have, having this confidence uh, for the rest of my career. And as for the IMS, uh, I would say that during the, the, the negotiation, uh, I uh, was lucky enough to, uh, as a very uh, young diplomat, to work on the verification, verification part of this treaty, including on-site inspection mechanism and also IMS and uh, IDC and so many contact, concept and ideas that um, I've been working on in black and white. Now we are talking about uh, how we how we further this effort in reality, this is indeed marvelous. But at the time for negotiation, I would say the uh, IMS system, international data center, and all these things are first and foremost for the purpose of the treaty verification. Right. 
at that time, nobody can imagine that it, can, it has to take so many years for the treaty to come into force. But I think by that time, we are collecting all, I mean, the, the best and necessary elements for treaty verification in the treaty text the IMS, International Data, Data Center, Infrasound, and you know, so many uh, uh, state-of-the-art uh, technologies. We put them together. And uh, I would say that as, re as a result of this uh, treaty negotiation, we have indeed have a very effective uh, provisional operating verification system globally. And uh, I'm also very happy to learn that uh, this, this uh, system is also contributing to a wider range of purpose, not only for international peace and security, but also for, for, for development. Mm. So this is why I'm, we are here for this science and technology conference to uh, further elaborate and further utilize this system uh, to uh, further benefit at all the uh, members of the, of the international community. This is indeed a very marvelous, success, successful story for this system. And, and one that uh, wasn't sort of planned as such at the outset, because it was more important to get uh, the treaty signed and to get a verification system that would serve that treaty and the, uh, the aim of that treaty, namely ending nuclear testing. But there are so many positive side effects, as we will hear now uh, from Dr. Paris Campos as uh, the first. Now, you're a geophysical engineer and seismologist. Uh, you're the director of the CTBTO's International Monitoring System Division. Um, the IMS uses four distinct technologies to monitor the globe for nuclear tests. So there's seismic, there's a hydroacoustic, infrasound, and uh, radionuclide data. Uh, it was discovered that the data that the system collects also has other uses. Uh, to what other areas can this data then be applied to? Well, let me start by saying that the system has been very su successful in its mandate. As we heard from Dr. Floyd this morning, no nuclear test goes in secret. We are able to detect it with this incredible network composed of those four technologies that you just mentioned, distributed around all the globe within uh, 29 countries. Um, but this data is just wonderful, very high quality, uh, very uh, timely produced, uh, sent to the IDC where it's processed and analyzed, and it's also uh, distributed to the national data centers with other countries can make use of this data. It's used for um, the verification regime, but it has been also used for its own purposes like monitoring seismic activity mm. in the countries or in the regions. Tonight, we have a, Sp a Spanish-speaking panel and we'll hear the example of Republican Dominican that it's using the data in their national data center for seismic monitoring. Also, we heard from Dr. Floyd this morning that during the conference, we will hear some results uh, on some observations from infrasound, hydroacoustic, and seismic stations that recorded the explosion of the, I'm not gonna try it, sorry. I, I cannot say it full, <laughs> Conga Tonga a volcano. I, I apologize for not learning the full name of the volcano. Jeff will help us out later, no doubt. Please, <laughs> uh, I, I really admire Dr. Floyd how he managed to do it, the whole thing. I'm, I'm just gonna call it Honga Tonga. Um, but that's another very nice example on how we are getting all this marvelous data and learning a lot about this kind of explosions. Um, also, we heard uh, and we read in, in a very famous uh, journal about the discovery of a new um, species of whales thanks to the wow. hydroacoustic data. And we will hear many examples during this week. Uh, for example, the use of humanitarian purposes and risk, the, risk the reduction um, for uh, that do, Dr. Can, Car Navati, sorry, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about it. And also in the Spanish speaker uh, uh, panel, we will hear the case of, of Chile and also the case of Spain and the case of Central America. They, they are receiving all this data for that purpose. Um, of course, uh, the radionuclide uh, stations have been also very useful in monitoring um, 
and the, the release of these particles. And Dr. Rizzo is going to talk about it, uh, and we'll see more examples during the week. So uh, this is very exciting mm -hmm. as a scientist. When I see this data, and I see that people is using it through the, the system, the BDEC uh, platform that, that Dr. Rizzo might, might talk about it, um, is, is just wonderful. And also to see a very committed team of people working every day to have this high quality data available to the world is just amazing. Fantastic. I wish I had known that you announced all the different sessions that are happening over the next few days. I would have uh, given you a warning to take note so that you don't miss any of that. But thank you so much for pointing that out. Uh, Dr. Kernavaji, so we've heard uh, about uh, the importance and the excitement that uh, the IMS the verification system and the data certainly that we have uh, is giving us, giving science. Um, you, as the head of Indonesia's Agency for Meteorology, Climatology, Geophysics, and chair of the Intergovernmental Coordination Group of Indian Ocean Tsunami Warning and Mitigation System. It's a long title, but what's due is due. Uh, so you know firsthand the value of this data. I would like to, to you to share, if you could, uh, how this data contributes to your work when it comes to tsunami early warning efforts and uh, disaster risk prevention. Well, uh, let, let me start with the important remarks by the Secretary General, uh, Dr. Floyd, this morning. This roof is not falling down because of the systematic measurement. Indeed, it is really true. Back to the year of 2004, with the Indian Ocean tsunami, could you imagine in the beautiful morning, Sunday morning, everyone have a picnic, uh, uh, relax in the Indian coastal area, Indian Ocean coastal area. And suddenly, 30 meter wave with the speed of almost 500 meter per hour. It's like a jet speed hit us. Didn't we have any measurement? We do have. We do have measurement. We have seismograph, which can be calculated to predict or to provide the warning for tsunami. But unfortunately, our measurement was not designed in a systematic system. Just measurement. So that's why almost 230,000 of people death and about 10 million of US dollar economic losses. So we learn very much the importance of systematic measurements. So that's why in 2008, Indonesia signed um, early, a tsunami early warning arrangement with the CTBTO. Since then, we have, starting November 2008, we have systematic measurement. We have the truly early warning system. At that time, it's still less than 100 measurements, but has been in the system. Then, 2012, uh, we ratified uh, the treaty in 2012. And uh, we received about six uh, CTBTO auxiliary uh, IMS. And indeed, it is very important to support the timely, accurate uh, early warning. However, however, in 2018, we do have the system measurements of seismograph. And we have another tsunami. We do not know if the tsunami will happen because actually the earthquake which is measured by the system is due to the lateral movement of the ground floor mm. of the sea. In theory, it must not be a tsunami. 
because the tsunami must be the vertical movement, no vertical movement. So what happened? We have the system and we cannot cope with the tsunami. The warning was late. Actually, the warning system in 2018 is for five minutes. So when we have the earthquake, within five minutes, maximum five minutes, the warning must be released because normally the tsunami comes in 20 minutes. That's the normal condition. What happened in 2018, our system was not able to detect because the tsunami come in two minutes instead of 20 minutes. Didn't play by the rules. Yeah. So we, we could not give the warning because actually no, no tsunami happened. So we learn. We learn it is non, uh, it is, uh, we call that a combined seismic and non-seismic. It is because something else. So that means we need additional instruments hmm. in the systems. That the instrument to detect as soon as possible the changing of the sea level. We have that, we have that. Unfortunately, the system was collapsed because of the earthquake shaking is very strong, the system was collapsed. So what we need indeed is the systematic system, but need to be uh, strengthened under any shaking. So that's the le learn. And the last learning is in 2000, still in 2018, there is no earthquake at all. No earthquake at all. Suddenly tsunami comes. We have the system. No earthquake. What happened? I suspect something wrong. It must be volcano. And our agency is not responsible to monitor the volcano. And the volcano is monitored by a different agency. So we learn again. Indeed, we need to have systematic systems. We need to have additional strengthening. And also, we need to have data exchange. Right, partnerships. Partnerships, yeah. open data yeah. policy. So this is what we learn about the international monitoring system. All of that to be dedicated for the human life, for the safety of human life. And thanks uh, the support from CTBTO. And we do need several others, uh, different types yeah, in order to detect not only the tsunami because of the seismic, but also because of the tsunami, uh, sorry, because of the volcanic eruption, like in Tonga, and also uh, because of other, other like uh, landslides, submarine landslides. So there are uh, various types of tsunami. Mm -hmm. So that's why we are really eager to, to participate, to join in CTBTO in order to have like infrasound, which can detect uh, various types of a frequency of the wave yeah and finally now starting in 2004 we have only 20 seismograph when the indian ocean tsunami happened no system and now we have almost 500 instruments seismograph with uh, several uh, uh, satellite support and hopefully through ctbto we can more stronger and save more people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanarati. I'll, I'll get back to some of those things you said. Thank you so much. Uh, but first, Dr. Rizzo, um, Dr. Perez Campos already sort of rolled up the red carpet uh, to you, the international monitoring system designed to detect nuclear tests. And we heard that over the years, there's been the realization that the data collected could also be used for other applications, of course, including contributing to scientific inquiry. And in your work, uh, you used uh, what uh, Dr. Paris Campos referred to as the VDEC, the Virtual Data Exploitation Center. And it would be very interesting to find out in what way this is unique for your work, how it's aided your work. Yes, indeed, we, we use this instrument uh, in a triangular way because uh, we are uh, running the National Data Center for Adenuclide in our country for the CTVT verification. But uh, along our study, um, we were focusing uh, uh, and we were collecting a lot of data from the IMS network, analyzing data, reading and uh, discussing data from the International Data Center. And several times we find uh, some anomalies in the, in, in the detection. And we can screen out this anomaly. We are sure that are not related to any violation, but still, as a scientist, we were curious about that. 
why this station is behaving in that way, why we have this periodically uh, detection. And uh, during a public uh, presentation of the CTBO purpose in, in our municipality, uh, we received a question from, uh, from the public. It was a professor from the uh, University of Statistics. And he said, uh, oh, you have uh, one of the key enabling technologies uh, for uh, Industry 4.0's evolution. You have uh, big data, you have uh, data cloud, and you have data mining. Why can't you spread with us uh, uh, all these, uh, these the technologies uh, in order to, to understand better how to control the process because uh, you know the statistical approach can be used to make uh, process control of uh, an equipment or a device or a system and uh, for us it was a, a very strange question because we know about confidentiality we cannot spread anything with you it's a nuclear security purpose uh, we are uh, an agreement with our minister but uh, luckily we have a very interesting conversation during science and technology with uh, provisional technical secretary people that explain uh, this instrument, the VDEC instrument. And so they, they gave us a lot of support to understand uh, the purpose, also the procedure to get uh, this uh, VDEC contract signed. At the beginning, we were thinking that uh, we should pay for having data. And so the universe said, no, no, we were not paying anything. And finally, five years ago, we, the university signed the VDEC contract. We are uh, in the, this triangle, so university, Provisional Technical Secretariat and National Data Center. And we worked together. So we were able to share with them the data that we can share with them. Obviously, we still ta take uh, some data that are confidential. And uh, we, we, can, uh, we can make uh, some statistical analysis uh, applying this concept uh, to the noble gas monitoring stations. The, the really interesting things uh, uh, for, for us is just uh, it was a way to take our feet on the, on the ground, you know, because when you are working for something that you would like never happen, sometimes you lose some reality. And, uh, and so this is, was a way. For them, it was a way to have access to this data. And it was very important also another, another uh, purpose of, the, of this uh, VDEC contract. You should imagine that the students uh, uh, are going to discuss their activities uh, during their final examination. And they are discussing in front of their teachers, yes, but also in front of their friends, families, siblings. And so now in our city, we have a, a community of civil society that know about CTBTO, verification regime, international monitoring system. This is very important because the real people know what are we doing uh, in, uh, in our work. And the other benefits that, uh, that the university has received from us, and I, I've already mentioned before, is that uh, in CTBTO, as a scientist, I can, uh, I can tell you that there is a, a different approach to the scientific research. And it was, uh, I called, a collaborative competi competition. You know that scientists are competitors by nature, and they are very jealous about the data try to, to ask a, a scientist to share their data with you before he has made any publication, he will uh, get uh, uh, no answer at all. And, uh, but in, during CTBTO, we still, as scientists, are competitors. We want to arrive before the other to find something. But uh, we have a common objective, and this helps us to have this collaborative competition that is really very rich and you can, you can, uh, you can reach a lot of, uh, of objectives much more faster and much more stronger than uh, in, the other, in the other way. And finally, uh, with this uh, collaboration with university, we can, uh, we can uh, attract uh, also young people, you know, young people and also a lot of diversity people. So uh, it's a way because, uh, you know, in, uh, in the nuclear security uh, field, uh, there is some uh, common figure, common uh, features of people, scientists, uh, engineering, a lot of men. And, uh, and uh, in this way, we can attract and we can expose to these uh, objectives also young people and female people and uh, that let them uh, to start uh, to work uh, in this uh, subject. Wonderful. I take with me that, please, please, yes, absolutely. Because you stressed it, you know, that uh, when you said, first of all, you thought you had to pay for the data. Uh, I think it can't be stressed enough, especially we live in, in times where profit 
so often it's absolutely everything, but not when it comes to the CT, uh, VTO and uh, the VDEC program and the data sharing. Also, as you mentioned about competitiveness, competition is good, but, and there I quote Ambassador Lee, it's about having the same goal. Competition should not get in the way of achieving the goal, clearly. So that is what I'm taking away from that right now. And uh, the communication, the bit about them presenting everything in front of their family, that would have scared me a lot. Family and friends, that's the worst audience you can imagine. Uh, Jeff Broomfield, your field is also quite clearly communication. That's what you do, and your coverage of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty goes back to 2009, at least, I'm told. That's when you covered it for the Scientific American magazine. Um, and as a journalist, uh, it, why is the work of the CTBTO it's quite complex to an outside world. Why should it be relevant to your readers, your listeners? And, and how do you translate this complexity in order to make it relevant to them? Well, it's a very odd time to be a journalist, I would say, um, because we've never, well, I mean, I can't remember so much misinformation just flying around the world. People just, say anything these days, you know, I mean, um, they're, you know, politicians and, and influencers and, and just all sorts of things about, you know, coming through COVID and all that, I had to cover a lot of that. And yet there is such a hunger for data among readers and viewers and listeners, and there's so much more data out there. I mean, the conflict in Ukraine, the beginning of that showed up on Google Street Maps as traffic jams in key areas. So we live in this very sort of dissonant time where on the one hand, there's a lot of narratives that are quite questionable. And on the other hand, there's more data than ever. And I think navigating that as a journalist is really tricky. I think where the CTBTO fits in and why I've been so steadfastly interested in it throughout my career as a science journalist it's you are just a key, key source of data. Um, and, and I've been thinking about all the different data that's come out um, through CTBTO. Um, you know, Fukushima, um, the Chelyabinsk meteor. Uh, I'm going to try and say it, Honga Tonga, Honga Hapai. Very good. Someone, you can shout if I got it wrong, but that was. Um, and of course, North Korea's nuclear testing. Um, at, at every turn, really, the CTBTO has been there, not always directly as an organization, but I think one of the key things, I was thinking about this the other day, is the fact that IMS data is available to academics in member states, and often those academics are the ones that provide it to the public, that, that end up talking about it with the public, but underpinning it is the CTBTO. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so it's been, it's been really key for several really important stories I've covered over the, over the past few decades, so, yeah. And what was the feedback? Say uh, that again? Your, your, your readers or your listeners, do they give you feedback? Do they say, thank you so much for this article, now I'm really <laughs> scared, or now you put my mind at ease? Do, do, do you get anything back about what you're writing? Oh, as a journalist, if only everyone would just write in and say thank you every time I, I wrote something. Oh, very That'd polite. Nice. Um, no, you know, the feedback, the feedback is really in the way the articles spread. Um, again, like in an era where misinformation can spread, I can tell you data spreads too. Um, when you put out their information about the size of the eruption in Tonga Tonga, millions and millions of people want to read about that. They want to see what this organization has to say about it. They want to know how it compares to past atmospheric testing, you know, mm -hmm. nuclear explosions. Um, and so, yes, again, when, when I started, I, I think it, when I say there's a hunger, that's reflected in the attention that these stories get when they are published and when the organization speaks and the credibility that the CTBTO right. has. Yeah. Uh, Ambassador Lee, uh, you said it at the beginning, of your, you're well aware of all the different uh, possibilities that the IMS is, is now offering. Um, but in what way does China contribute to the IMS? 
uh, I would say the, uh, China's contribution to IMS and to the whole uh, international monitoring system operated by CTBTO are, are two folds. On the one hand, we are working uh, effectively to get, together with the CTBTO, the team of uh, Dr. Floyd, to make sure that uh, China's contribution according to treaty obligation to the IMS system uh, will, be, uh, will continue to be the most effective one and both for our laboratories, our stations, and so on and so forth. So we are, over the past more than two decades, we have uh, these kind of cooperation is running very well. And on the other hand, so we are also working together with uh, CTBTO and also many uh, countries, uh, especially from developing world, so that to, uh, to, to make sure that this system is not only contributing to the treaty verification purpose, but also to a wider range of uh, application, uh, which, the, which this uh, system can benefit member states and the international community. Uh, before this meeting, uh, we discussed with the Indonesian colleague that uh, uh, we have uh, very good bilateral cooperations uh, in this regard, and I believe this kind of, kind of cooperation is happening between China and uh, many other countries, especially from the developing world. So we will continue to, uh, to make sure that uh, the two-fold effort on my part, on, on the part of my country, will continue to benefit not only for the treaty purpose, but also for a wider range of uh, civilian uh, application of the IMS system. Thank you so much. I have a question for our three scientific representatives here, uh, because in the speech of Dr. Floyd at the beginning, there was a beautiful image about, you know, thinking out of the box, and especially how this uh, conference uh, offers itself to meeting of the people who think out of the box, but they might have different boxes, and together you create yet another new box. Uh, with this image, I'm wondering what kind of new box has uh, the IMS um, created for you in your experience. I mean, Dr. Perez, uh, Campos, Mexico obviously has seen its, its share of earthquakes, very earthquake prone, and there were two uh, magnitude eight earthquakes, even above uh, one in 1985, that obviously was before the treaty was signed, before we had the IMS, uh, and the other one in 2017. I'm wondering, was the difference noticeable now that we have that data? Yeah, it, it was a big difference. Uh, if I refer to the earthquake in 85, there was only very few stations in Mexico and in the world. And I would say 2017 earthquake was probably the best registered earthquake in Mexico of magnitude 8, not only nationally, but also globally. Um, so the, the other very important thing on thinking outside the box that CTBTO offers and the IMS offers is that before we used to think on, on solutions with the separate technologies. Seismologists only use seismic stations, acoustics only use um, hydroacoustic stations, and it came infrasound. And actually CTBTO was pioneer on setting up the infrasound stations. And now you have scientists combining the old technologies in making new science and new, um, finding new things. And then you combine uh, the, the radionuclide stations and then you have a whole different spectrum. So I think CTBTO is allowing scientists to think out of the box. Yeah. And for Mexico, we, we use um, the, the uh, the seismic stations mainly to, to monitor the, the big earthquakes that happened in 2017. But um, we'll hear also tonight <laughs> how infrasound stations are being used to monitor um, volcanoes in Latin America. Mm -hmm. So you will find the combination of both technologies, seismic and infrasound. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kanavati, I was just, there was just one point when you were uh, talking earlier about all the learnings uh, and how important it is, obviously, that the warning goes out early enough for people to take heed. How tech-savvy are the people? How do you translate the warning, the data, that it actually reaches people, that they understand what to do? Well, I'm sorry. 
Well, that's the most challenging part. How could we transfer the warning from uh, high technology into very simple, should be understandable by the people? So uh, we are trying to combine the high technology and then strengthening with the local or traditional technology. For instance, uh, we send the national warning from the capital to the capital of the province. And then from uh, the province, uh, the, the community can, can choose which one uh, will be the most appropriate for them depend on the locality. So when we have a CTBTO instrument like a seismograph, yeah, indeed it is very useful for us because the spot is, is quite uh, uh, wide range. Yeah? And then it is integrated into the national system, a national network. And then the warning can be provided then, for instance, from Jakarta, go to Banda Aceh. In Banda Aceh, they have their own, they also use the national warning, but not only that. Still, the local from the mosque, from the church, so, so it's like that. So we, we need to have integration of uh, local and uh, advanced technology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karnavati. Briefly, Dr. Rizzo, because you mentioned something about going to schools and them having to present uh, themselves and what they know. Uh, and you mentioned about this opens the door to diversity and also to, to female, young female scientists. Why is that important? Yes, it's, it's very important because you know that uh, progress are going to go forward uh, because of uh, the, a collective brain. So we need a lot of brain work together to, to finalize some, some research. And this is also important because uh, uh, diverse people carry some different uh, priority and different objective. But everybody should have uh, uh, the right to raise the, the voice to say something about uh, uh, a, a particular topic. So this is why it's so important mm -hmm. for us. We realize uh, uh, also in, the, in our daily life in the laboratory that is very important to have different people coming also from different countries sometimes it's very interesting because they can have a different approach and they can propose solution and it's really very important just not to be all, 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 all the time self yeah. uh, explaining and uh, this, uh, this is a way we can, uh, we can uh, go towards a common objective Having also a lot of uh, female engaged in this, in this topic is, is also very important because uh, they will, uh, you know, female will pass the, the, the knowledge and the, to the, the, the next generation. So it is important that, uh, uh, because sometimes for young people it's not really very important what your mother are doing or is doing or what your father is doing, but it's very important what your girlfriend is doing. And so this is very <laughs> important that because we can, we can, uh, we can let the message go through the, the generation. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rizzi. Um, Ambassador Lee, um, obviously, as you have been there from the very beginning, uh, it is you, it has to be you, to have uh, the last word in this panel discussion. You were just hearing various uh, examples uh, of uh, the data being collected by the MS being used. Uh, something that you probably didn't foresee when you were part of those treaty negotiations almost 30 years ago. Um, how surprising is this to you? And even more importantly, where do you see the future of the IMS? Uh, I believe what has been discussed now and uh, over the past sessions of uh, Science and, Tech, uh, and Technology Conference uh, indicate the value of both the Treaty of CTBT and also the IMS. And it is indeed a very successful story, both for the treaty, the norms set by the treaty, and also IMS contribute to the world. And I believe that in the, in the years to come, we will continue to benefit from this norm and also benefit from the contribution of IMS to a wider range of 
uh, international community, both in the uh, security aspect and also for the developed experts. I have con full confidence in this regard, and uh, I both for my country and uh, in my personal capacity, I will continue to contribute to this course. You have my words, Robert. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Lee. Thank you so much, Dr. Perez Campos. Thank you so much, Dr. Carnavati, Dr. Rizzo, and Jeff Broomfield. Time flies when you're having fun. Time is up, I'm afraid. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have to shake hands first, sorry, but I still have to tell you something. Thank you so much. Jeff, you mustn't miss out, thank you. Uh, because I promised you at the very beginning that obviously we're very much interested to keep you healthy and well-sustained. So yes, there is a lunch break coming up now. But before we break for lunch, just a few housekeeping notes. It'll help you later. First of all, lunch is until 2 p.m. and it is served in the Winter Garden and the Rittersaal. After lunch, please join us for a panel discussion on the role of the Francophonie and multilingualism in advancing international discussions, followed by a deep dive into how the EU and CBTO or CTBTO cooperation is contributing to nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. Interpretation into all official languages will be provided for in-person attendees and are sitting up there, the interpreters, perhaps you just want to thank them for all the great work they've been doing so far already. Thank you so much. Later today, we will have concurrent panels uh, in Arabic, French and Spanish on a range of topics from mutual benefits of the CTBT to building regional capacity to disaster risk mitigation. We encourage you, if you haven't done it yet, to download the SNT app on your mobile device, Apple Store, Google Play, uh, because that way you can find your way around. There's an agenda, there's biographies on all the speakers. It tells you pretty much everything. And we also invite you to post to social media about the conference using the hashtag SNT2023. Thank you so very much for having me here with you this morning. And now, enjoy your lunch. Program continues at 2 p.m. <laughs>